Okay, now we're starting. Okay, I'm recording on Snagit, so we're going to get an MP4 and post it on YouTube. Thank you all for joining us. This is our first lecture um, you know, on the OHUC San Diego uh, Navy uh, CME program. And uh, uh, right up front, I got a whole lot of help on this. Uh, I want to thank Captain Wessels and Lieutenant Commander Henley and uh, uh, East Coast Commander Rothen, Lieutenant Commander Tate. Um, I want to thank the IT guy at Rota, Naval Hospital Rota. <laughs> he, I, he helped me tremendously to get this thing up and running. He was, I, I was going down the hall bugging the IT guy at Rota for a long time. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and start the lecture. Um, so this is uh, uh, about reducing medication errors and. Um, the um, I'm going to start off with a quick anecdote on gun control. You'll see what I mean when, when I do this, and then I will uh, uh, dispel some myths associated with that. Um, so, so these are new statistics. I just updated this. So think about the population of the United States is 324 million. Uh, the number of physicians in the United States is about 970,000 right now. Accidental deaths by physicians per year are about 120,000. Accidental deaths per physician is 0.124. Uh, now compare that with guns. And uh, boy, I, I didn't, you know, obviously the, the Las Vegas thing came up um, after, way after I wrote this lecture. Um, so it becomes a little bit more timely. Um, and uh, uh, um, as, a, as a complete aside, my my brother lives behind Mandalay Bay. Uh, my nephew was in the building at Mandalay Bay when that whole thing happened. So this is uh, kind of touches home for me anyway. Um, but uh, the number of gun owners in the United States is 103 million. Uh, and by the way, these statistics coming up, I believe, are straight out of the NRA. Uh, so, but, but I'm going to dispel some myths right after this, so I'm, I'm not advocating anything. So about 104 million people have guns in the United States. The number of accidental gun deaths per year in all age groups is about 1,500. The number of accidental deaths per gun owner is about 0. 0.000014. Um, so if you, these statistics are not correct. I'll just tell you that right off the bat, or at least they're in they're, uh, they're not, you gotta be careful how you interpret these, but, uh, this is what the NRA puts on their website and you, um, that, uh, you know, statistically doctors are approximately 9,000 times more dangerous than gun owners. Okay. Let me, the next slide, I, I went and dispelled some of this stuff. So you get, so you guys get a better idea of what this is all about. Um, I like a quote, um, so Mark Twain, you guys have probably heard this quote, there are lies, there are damn lies, and there are statistics. Um, so that's uh, Mark, Mark, my favorite quote from Mark Twain. Um, in 2014, so 33,594 persons died from firearm injuries in the, in the United States. 16.8 percent of all injury deaths uh, in that year. Uh, that's what that was. Um, two major components of firearm injury. This is a brand new slide. This lecture is 10 years old, and I updated it uh, tremendously for you know for OHSU San Diego. Uh, and th this is a brand new slide because I, I didn't. Uh, if you just look at that gun control slide, you think, oh my God, gun guns are way safer. And then not quite, uh, if you look at this. Um, two major components uh, caused firearm injury deaths in, in 2014. Um, two major components, uh, excuse me, two major component causes of injury deaths. You can delete the word firearm there. In 2014, were suicide and homicide. Um, if you look on the CDC website, um, I didn't put this on there, but uh, I do, it's interesting. The number 10 cause of death in the United States is suicide. Uh, that's a different lecture which I'm going to give coming up. But uh, so in 2014, a total of 49,000 people died of drug-induced causes in the United States, um, and this includes deaths from poisoning, medical conditions caused by legal or illegal drugs, um, and medically prescribed and other drugs. So this statistic excludes. Um, unintentional injuries, homicides, and other indirect uh, related uh, injuries due to drug abuse, uh, as well as newborn deaths. Um, so um, the um, anyway, um, so you, you got to interpret that. If you look on the website for the NRA, they, they have this silly thing about gun, you know guns being nine thousand times safer than doctors, and not quite true based upon <clears throat> what we just talked about. Uh, but you, um, so this lecture, as an overview, um, I'm going to show you the references where I got the information. 
Uh, this exact slide set, uh, as well as the lecture, is going to be posted on YouTube. Um, so you can look up the references if you want. Um, U.S. mortality statistics um, uh, directly off, off the CDC and the NIH websites and um, are available. Uh, I was going to go over a couple, uh, four case studies because they're really interesting. One of my little hobbies that I've had for the last 10 or 15 years is, is malpractice, medical legal medicine. Um, I'm, very, I'm very interested in how other doctors get busted because I'm, you know, obviously I'm ulterior motives. I'm trying to prevent that in, in myself and I'm trying to keep my patients safe. Uh, and in a, in a former life way before now, I kind of wanted to do the JDMD thing, but <laughs> that's not going to happen right now. I'm too, I don't, I don't want to go back to school, but, um, so the, to err is human. There was a, this whole lecture came out of a, a, a an, an article. Um, but it's called To Air as Human, Building a Safer Health System. And I'm going to talk about that article, and I'm going to talk about the uh, studies associated with that article. Um, and I'm going to talk about malpractice claims, simple strategies to avoid medication errors, uh, error-prone abbreviations. Uh, that's really important in avoiding uh, drug-induced uh, errors. Drug classes and risks, high alert specialties, and percentage of claims by specialty. I got a lot of these uh, slides and information off of NorCal. Um, uh, they, they publish these monographs, and they give them to all their doctors who have malpractice insurance. And it's extremely useful um, if, uh, you know, looking at that information. But I, I gleaned the, uh, the important information and kind of uh, interspersed it into this uh, lecture. So, um, the, so references, the reducing medication errors. That, uh, th this is a monograph by NorCal 2004. Um, to Err as Human, uh, that was the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, 1999. If, um, so I'm one of the, Eh, I'm somewhat somewhat older. I'm 51. Uh, if 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 you guys were practicing medicine back in 1999, you remember newspaper articles said, "Oh my God, doctors kill three jumbo jets uh, of people uh, every year." So that's the 1,500 patients or whatever. Uh, you know the the you know they're trying to get people to buy their newspaper, uh, saying that you know doctors kill all these people. Well, it's like it's it's sensationalistic, and uh, it's it's better to kind of look at what those deaths are caused by and how to reduce errors. Um, I'm not going to go through all these uh, references here, but you, you can look back at those later. Um, and let's see. So U.S. mortality in 2014. Uh, this is a, I added this new slide. I just looked this up. By the way, 2014 is the last time you can get data on this. That's why it doesn't say 2017. Uh, in 2014, a total of 2,624,418 deaths uh, were registered in the United States. Um, life expectancy, I thought was interesting, because uh, that's related to what we're talking about, is 78.8 years. I did not, I'm going to put in there later, uh, you guys all know that women live longer than men. That's not too relevant for this lecture, but 78.8 years is not men and women. It's, it's, there's a difference. Um, the 15 leading causes of death in 2014. I, I, they're all listed here. I'm not going to read all 15. Um, I, heart disease is always number one. I, I, that, that's without a doubt. In Greece and Japan, people live to be 100 because they eat differently than us, um, but that's a, a different uh, topic, and I, I, I'm probably going to present that lecture later. Um, so cancer is number two, chronic lower respiratory diseases. When they say that, they mean COPD, smoking. It used to, uh, When I went to medical school, it was number four. It's number three now. Uh, uh, so um, number four is accidents. That's the category we're talking about today, the unintentional injuries. So Unintentional injury includes, oops, the doctor killed the patient, you know, or the nurse, or the system. It's a system-wide, uh, you know, problem. It's not the doctor or the nurse necessarily, um, and in fact, it rarely is. It's a system uh, error, uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, I'm not going to read over all these other ones. I, I number ten, I just found fascinating. I, I, it's not even part of this lecture. I just unintentional self-harm, suicide. Um, uh, that. That just really surprised me when I saw that. Um, and you can read the other causes of death here. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to go through four cases right now. And oh, and by the way, um, I'm deliberately uh, not answering questions in the middle of the lecture because uh, I'll probably get sidetracked. I'm going to uh, 
turn off the Snagit where I'm recording this and posting it on YouTube as an MP4 file, and and then I'm going to answer questions, uh, you know, on DCS the webinar as well as the uh, conference call um, at the end. This lecture is not going to take me an hour. It's going to take me 40, 45 minutes tops. Um, so case number one, 53-year-old female presented to the ENT doctor complaining of nasal blockage, right ear pain, and headaches. The ENT doctor examined the patient and prescribed beclomethasone for congestion, propranolol for migraines. The patient returned to the office one month later complaining of headaches. The ENT doctor recommended and gave samples of verapamil for headaches. The next day the patient was taken to the ER, found down, diaphoretic, unresponsive, hypotensive probably uh, at this point. Uh, she took verapamil uh, without discontinuing the propranolol and she suffered a severe drug reaction. Hypotensive, severe bradycardia. She lived, um, but this is a lawsuit. And by the way, this, these, these cases are straight out of NorCal. These cases are slam dunk lawsuits where you don't even, it doesn't even help you to hire a lawyer because you just ask them how much money they would like because you, you know, the doctor screwed up. Um, the, um, so I, this obviously, you, you guys can already know how to fix this uh, and that's medication reconciliation. Don't prescribe a medication without knowing exactly what the patient is taking. Um, and um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Case number two, 19-year-old uh, female presented to the OBGYN doctor asking for contraceptive injections. She was previously on oral contraceptives. The doctor gave her the first injection of, of medroxyprogesterone or Depo-Provera at that visit. Then 13 weeks later, uh, came in for the next injection, but had a five pound weight gain and abdominal fullness. The doctor and you, I didn't write it here, but you can you can see what I'm getting at. The doctor did not check a pregnancy test, did uh, and gave a second injection of Depo-Provera. Uh, no mention of a pelvic exam, no mention of a menstrual cycle. Uh, so uh, and I'll talk about how to fix this. It's uh, pretty obvious. But the patient subsequently found out she was pregnant, and she aborted her pregnancy because she could not. Uh, obtain sufficient safety information from the doctor or anybody else that nothing was going to be wrong with the baby, the fetus. So, obvious solution here, you always record the, the last menstrual period on females. Uh, it's almost like a vital sign. In fact, um, it's one of my other lectures eventually is going to be pain management, but uh, the, the fifth vital sign is not pain. Don't use pain uh, and uh, use you know, the last menstrual period in females uh, you know, is, is my suggestion. So you, you, I, what I always tell people, uh, and I, uh, I'm a professor at UCSD, and, I, um, uh, and what I tell residents and medical students and anybody, any other doctors in my practice when I'm, when I'm mentoring people is get a pregnancy test on anybody who walks in your office between about 11 years old and 60 um, for the most part, or at least know what they're, unless they have a complete normal menstrual periods and a, and a last menstrual period less than 30 days, for example. Um, and by the way, for depo, the way to avoid this, obviously, is get a pregnancy test. Get a urine pregnancy test before giving the depo. That's not evidence-based medicine, by the way. Um, and uh, uh, there's times when you don't have to do that, but I'm not going to go through that on this lecture. Um, case number three, 61-year-old male with renal disease and a follow-up with the nephrologist. Uh, he was receiving peritoneal di dialysis via the Tenkoff ca catheter. Patient developed an infection at the catheter site. The patient was started on genomycin for 10 days. One month later, they had a recurrence of the infection at the catheter site, and the patient was placed on genomycin again. Uh, infection continued, and the catheter had to be removed. Genomycin was continued for 20 more days, but the patient complained of vertigo and tinnitus due to over-administration of genomycin, right? It's ototoxic. Um, so the expert reviewers uh, were critical of the doctor for long-term uh, administration of an ototoxic medication in a, in a patient already, who already had impaired renal function. I, I don't know what the creatinine was on this, but uh, when other equally effective and better tolerated medications might be available. So medication error, right? Um, and uh, so 
the um, the study uh, to Air is Human building a safer health system it was front page on every newspaper in the entire country for like weeks uh, about oh my god doctors are killing patients because they they're, they're all these medication errors so that that's where this lecture comes from but it's it's obviously uh, relevant for uh, forever you know it's uh, giving medications in a safe manner is important um, 1999 Institute of Medicine report uh, at the time they said medical must it, this was a study uh, studies uh, done out of New York uh, strangely enough by Boston researchers but I'm not sure how they how they decided that uh, but um, so medical mistakes uh, were 2.9 percent to 3.7 percent of hospitalizations so they looked at New York Colorado Utah and, and they just gathered all this data uh, these mistakes led to 8.8 percent to 13.6 percent of uh, to death, and 8.8 percent to 13.6 percent of cases. That's a that's a huge percent. 44,000 people die in the U.S. each year. <clears throat> that's an old statistic. It's pro it's probably a little bit higher right now, um, uh, especially with the increase in the U.S. population. But that's a huge number. So 44,000 people die. Um, from these medical mistakes uh it's not all medication errors but that's a that's a gigantic number uh more people die in one year from medical errors than from motor vehicle accidents breast cancer or aids <clears throat> so that um to me that's a <clears throat> an amazing statistic so um more about this study um medication errors cause about 7000 deaths per year so of that 44000 about 7000 are medication Medication errors account for <clears throat> one out of 131 outpatient deaths and one out of 854 inpatient deaths. So hospital costs are about $2 billion per year uh, associated with preventable adverse drug events. Um, so the, um, <clears throat> the Institute of Medicine uh, document reviewed numerous other studies. So here, here's a couple other studies that are um, uh, informative. So Brennan, Harvard Medical Practice Study, New England Journal, 1991. Um, the, um, so 30,000 randomly selected New York hospital records check for adverse events, and these were defined as injuries caused by medical management rather than an underlying disease. So they weren't looking at somebody having a disease and dying. They were looking at the, somebody at the hospital uh, or the hospital system uh, causing death. So part one of the study, there were 1,133 adverse events. The incidence rate was about 3.7% of hospitalizations. 27% were due to negligence. Um, now, all these people did not get sued, by the way. It's kind of like you know drunk driving. The fact that the CHP catches somebody driving drunk, they estimate that that's one out of 10 people on the highway. So nine out of 10 people were driving drunk and didn't get caught. Same concept here. Uh, the fact that you caught a, caught a certain percent of these, uh, there's a whole bunch of more medical errors that did not result in lawsuits or, um, you know, that did not get caught. Um, so extrapolated to the entire state of New York, this is only one state, 98,000 adverse events and 27 of these, thousand of these were due to negligence. So... Um, more about this study. Uh, again, this was 30,000 randomly selected New York hospital records. Part two analyzed the actual injuries identified in part one. The most common adverse event was drug complications, 19% of those 1,133 adverse events. So examples, uh, bone marrow suppression, bleeding, allergic reactions, CNS uh, side effects, cardiac side effects, GI, renal, respiratory problems. 18% of these adverse drug events uh, were judged as negligence. So, um, and another study, and this is the last study I think we're going to kind of go over, um, the examine all U.S. death certificates, 1983 to 1993. 1983, there were 1,876 deaths due to medication errors. 1993, there were 7,391 deaths due to medication errors. And more than more than double the 1983 st uh, statistics. So outpatient deaths rose eightfold, inpatient deaths rose 2.3 times. So um, we're going to talk about ways to do this, but you know, you know the take-home message here is just be very vigilant in monitoring medications. Uh, and I'm going to throw an aside in here because I do a lot of teaching, um, and uh, my uh, uh, my private, you know, my my role as a as a chief medical officer in my, in my civilian side, and uh, so you know I have 
I don't know, 100 or 200 staff. I probably got 10 or 15 doctors and uh, maybe five or 10 nurse practitioners and PAs. And um, what I always do when I do chart reviews, or I don't, I, I don't like doing peer reviews uh, and dinging people necessarily. I like talking to people first and educating them. But for example, when you, you order a statin, a uh, cholesterol medication, get the LFTs once every six months or... Um, you know, you order medications that require a basic metabolic panel. Uh, so, and the, the typical one is ACE inhibitors, lisinopril, captopril, whatever. You know, you got to get a basic metabolic panel once every three months, once every six months, or periodically. I review charts where it's been like two or three years and nobody's had a basic a lab, any labs, and the guy's been just continued on lisinopril, for example. So, uh, I can mention a lot more examples, but those are just two examples that kind of stick out in my head. Um, so malpractice claims. So Physician Insurers Association of America, uh, 1993 medication error study. So it used a claims database from 20 malpractice insurance companies. So this is not just NorCal now. This is this is looking at all these companies that provide malpractice insurance. Inclu it included claims in 1985 through 1992. So there were 90,166 total claims. 25,000 or 28 percent of those resulted in a payment. Uh, and uh, for for the doctors who are who are participating, or you know, uh, now or or later on uh, with the YouTube MP4, um, it, you guys know um, if a payment is made, you get reported to the National Physician Data Bank. If you get that, uh, it's very very difficult, if not if not impossible, to stay in the military or get future jobs. Um, so it's you know, I'm, I'm not trying to scare people, but it's. Uh, uh, you know, these are important things that happen. Uh, 66, uh, 6,600 or 7% of these are associate, were associated with prescription of medication. And uh, one reason I'm mentioning this is because I find practicing safe medication prescription very, very, very easy. You just got to do the right thing. And you have to be extremely meticulous and detailed in how you do it. And, and you won't make errors. You know? The um, payments made in, in uh, were 2,195 or 33% of these medication errors. That's $220 million. Uh, it averaged out $99,000 per prescription uh, error. So you got out your prescription pad, you scribbled, and 99,000 bucks went down the drain if you if you're one of these uh, uh, errors. Um, prescription of medication was the second most frequent and second most expensive procedure involved in these claims. So, a um, couple of statistics about malpractice claims. So, the top five most prevalent misadventures. That that word misadventure, I, I'm not. I don't make these terms up. That's a malpractice insurance company lawyer term. And it has an extremely specific definition, <laughs> but uh, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through the medical legal part of this. But um, <clears throat> the uh, when you see these terms, they're 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 things that are discussed in courtrooms. Um, and uh, um, I've been uh, very 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 lucky in my 25 years of practice, and never having a lawsuit or anything else. And uh, uh, and uh, but. Um, so, f top five most prevalent misadventures associated with liability claims nationwide. So, number one, improper performance, uh, and I'll, you know, I can talk about what these are. Diagnosis errors. Number two, failure to supervise or monitor a case. If you got PAs, um, nurse practitioners fall out of this uh, supervision thing now, which is interesting. I think they should be supervised just like PAs. But anyway, um, if you have a PA you have to review a certain percentage of their charts and it depends on what state you're in California has a specific number but anyway that's a that's a separate topic uh, and procedures not performed uh, so top six most expensive misadventures associated with liability claims nationwide <clears throat> number one improper performance no, number two, diagnosis errors. Number three, no medical medical misadventure. Um, I, I want to define a couple of these terms just because they, they sound really weird and, and I didn't know what they were until I looked it up. No med medical misadventure. So that's defined as no allegation of clinical error by the physician that caused the injury. Instead, the claims involve legal issues such as abandonment, lack of informed consent, 
violation of confidentiality, failure to supervise residents, vicarious liability for an action by a nurse. So <laughs> I'm not going to go into all this. That, that's a, those are separate lectures and separate issues, but, uh, but you, you get the idea <clears throat> of what these uh, might involve. Uh, number four, failure to supervise and monitor a case. Number five, procedure not performed. Number six, medication errors. The only reason I'm going through this slide is number six, right? We're, we're, we're having a lecture on reducing medication errors, so it, I'm trying to point out that number six uh, is, is pretty high on the list for medication errors. <clears throat> um, so high alert drugs and drug classes. Antibiotics are number one. Um, you know, that case we talked about with the genomycin causing ear ototoxicity. Glucocorticoid, cor, glucocorticoids, steroids. Um, and I'm going to throw my little two cents here on some of these just from my, uh, uh, my you know, opinions on how to stay safe. Don't prescribe glucocorticoids long term. Uh, they're short term ever and be very stingy with them. They're, they're not safe necessarily. Um, number three, narcotic and non-narcotic analgesics and narcotic antagonists. I have wonderful lectures on pain management and opioid <laughs> management. That seems about half my life, uh, but I'll talk. That's a separate lecture. We we can go over that in the future. But I, I'm fascinated with that, and I'm very uh, interested in quality of control. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, they're not safe. Ibuprofen, naproxen, be careful. Um, don't ever prescribe ibuprofen or naproxen without checking a creatinine. If you prescribe any of those and the guy's got a 1.6 creatinine and gets kidney damage, lawsuit, slam dunk lawsuit. Don't don't bother fighting it. You're you're in trouble. So in other words, check a BMP, check labs, and don't. The other thing is, don't um, people do this all the time? Don't let the guy walk out the door with naproxen while your lab is pending. You just gave him naproxen without knowing his creatinine and say, hey, come back tomorrow, come back, you know, I can't give it to you yet, let's check a blood test. And if he refuses a blood test, don't give him naproxen. Uh, you know, it's the same, you know, it's the, um, you can be very careful how you discuss that with the patient. Say, I have to give you Tylenol, um, I can't give it to you because I don't know your kidney function, for example. Number five, topicals, dermatologicals, uh, off the, I'm not going to try that. <laughs> I have trouble with that word. Um, anyway, eye medications. Um, so um, number six, uh, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to throw my two cents in there. Primary care doctors or nurses or PAs never, ever, ever prescribe or refill glaucoma medications. Trust me, or steroids, or ocular steroids, don't do it. Just, it's extremely simple. Say, listen, go see your eye doctor, uh, call them on the phone today. If the guy has glaucoma medications, if the guy has ocular steroids, he got it from an eye doctor. Don't refill it and don't prescribe it. Because uh, if, it, if it causes some adverse effect, you're in trouble because uh, it's out of your scope of practice as primary care. Um, cardiac and antihypertensive medications is number six. Number seven, tranquilizers, muscle relaxants, sedatives. Um, I'm going to throw my two cents on that one. So if you prescribe uh, uh, opioids, narcotics, <clears throat> don't ever let somebody take Valium, <clears throat> excuse me, benzodiazepines, which is Valium, Ativan, with opioids. Don't allow people to do it. Um, so anyway, that's what that's kind of one of the things that's getting at. Uh, major tranquilizers, uh, anticoagulants. Number nine is. So I, I always thought number nine was higher. <clears throat> Be careful with Coumadin anticoagulants. Um, if you uh, there's two ways to do Coumadin, right? Warfarin. Either if you got a small clinic or your uh, your uh, doctor or organization, you are the Coumadin clinic. I've been in several practices where I don't have a Coumadin clinic. I am the Coumadin clinic. Keep a really careful file and track these people. And if they don't come in for the INR, get your nurse on the phone to call them. And uh, so be very careful with uh, uh, warfarin. Um, top five high alert medications. Uh, so insulin, that goes without saying, right? Be careful of insulin. Opioids, narcotics, injectable potassium chloride. Um, I don't do a whole lot of inpatient medicine yet, but potassium injectable is very dangerous, but potentially, if done in the right way, it's not. Heparin, uh, and that's an inpatient medication, obviously. Sodium chloride solutions above 0.9%. Um, you know, for, for that, that's, now we do see that in the military, um, especially when I was stationed at Camp Pendleton with these young guys. Um, and uh, rhabdomyolysis, right? Rhabdomyolysis, dehydration, they get hypertonic saline, which is potentially dangerous. 
don't do it as a primary care doc or in your clinic somewhere. That guy's in the emergency room or the ICU. Uh, that's the way to avoid that error. Um, it, so it's monitored carefully. Um, so simple strategies to avoid medication errors. This is a new slide I made last month. Uh, I did most of this uh, update uh, when I was in Rota, in Naval Hospital Rota last month, because I had all the time in the world on my hands. Uh, it didn't get dark until 9.30 p.m. in Europe, which was fun. Uh, and I, I did a lot of research on this and updating. So simple strategies to avoid medication errors. Uh, patient information. Uh, so patient-specific identifiers. Ask the name and date of birth. Don't, I, I occasionally get, I find myself getting in trouble doing this in the exam room. I see a patient, I start, I just, I'm in a hurry, I start talking to him and I start documenting on the chart. And then, I don't know, a couple patients later, I go, oh boy, I documented on the wrong patient. That's because I didn't go in the room and say, hey, what's your name? What's your date of birth? Um, so the pharmacist does this. They're great at it. The pharmacist, you know, are, uh, this is their job for medications. We should do it when we go in, in an exam room. Say, uh, even, even on drill weekend for PHAs, just, it's really simple. Say, hey, uh, just, just double checking. What's your name and date of birth? Um, so verify allergies and reactions. Um, so that, that goes without saying. I, I don't even need to comment on that one. Uh, um, highlight critical diagnoses. Um, the um, so put on somewhere on the chart. If you have an electronic medical record, I, I I like the ones that have a little yellow or red sticky at the top. You know, electronic software sticky at the top where you can say, oh my god, this patient is allergic to whatever. Uh, if they're pregnant, ch females, childbearing age, write write big red sticky on the front of the paper chart if you have one, or somewhere on the chart. Uh, so it pops right up in your in your face, childbearing age. So for example, um, don't get flagell to child if somebody's pregnant. Don't give metformin if somebody's pregnant. Or be careful on some of these. It's not it's not a hundred percent don't give, but uh, you know there are certain drugs that are category uh, D for pregnancy, so don't do it. Um, and if you're not sure if they're pregnant, goes back to about four or five slides ago. Everybody between 11 years old and 60 years old, female, just get a pregnancy, get a urine HCG. Um, document smoking alcohol drugs. Um, so um, what, here's, and I'm going to throw in my little two cents on this one. 100% of patients who take any controlled substance, benzodiazepines, narcotics, have to get a urine drug screen. If the patient refuses, don't don't refill it and don't write it. Um, so um, if it pops positive for anything, take them. Don't refill it and don't write it. You, you're you're not allowed to write for controlled medications if somebody tests positive for cocaine or methamphetamine. Um, I personally put marijuana on that, and I'm not going to get into a debate with everybody about marijuana. But uh, you know, I don't think it's safe giving somebody narcotics if they're smoking, you know, four you know joints a day or something. Um, so update current medications. So medication reconciliation. Every single visit, in fact, uh, I'll extend that. Every single contact with the healthcare system should include a medication reconciliation. So patient shows up in your clinic, and then they go to the ER, and then they go to the ICU, and then they go to the nursing home, and then they go to physical therapy or whatever. Every single separate contact with the healthcare system you, that individual or clinic has to do a medication reconciliation so it's accurate. Um, and, uh, and the other thing I'll throw in there, um, uh, patients always say, I don't know my medications, or you don't speak, the, or, you know, as a provider, if we don't speak the language, for example, or we're not sure, I say, you know, sounds great, uh, uh, I can't refill or write or do anything with your medications today, um, uh, go home and put all your medications in a paper bag, brown bag, right? Brown bag of this thing, and bring them in to see me. Um, now, the other thing I do, be very, I, I don't make people wait on that. I say, hey, bring me the brown bag. Or I, actually, I have my nurse do it. If I have a great nursing staff, say, bring your medications later on this afternoon so we can verify the medication reconciliation. Or I will personally see them in the morning for a, you know, three-minute visit to do that. Um, standardized height and weight measurements. Uh, so be careful with you know uh, pounds, centimeters, uh, kilograms. You know, standardize how you do it, and it should be metric really. But um, drug information. So th this the pharmacist, a good pharmacist can do a lot of this for you. But maintain uh, good drug references. Uh, so there's some examples: uh, drug facts and comparisons, Hippocrates. 
Um, one thing I do all the time now, I, I do a little bit of hospice and palliative care on the uh, per diem in the uh, weekends and evenings a little bit. Uh, one thing I do all the time is uh, I, I'll call the pharmacist and say, hey, just I just want to double check the dose on this or I want to see if I can give this rectally or IV or subcutaneously or or whatever. Uh, so I uh, or I just ask my nurse to do it if she's involved in that in that care. Um, so um, I use my pharmacist. I, I my first year out of medical school many 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 years ago I didn't do that and I was thinking and finally I realized oh my god what a what an incredible resource I have like on the phone down the hall or down the hallway or whatever. Um, identify high alert medications, warfarin, uh, heparin, insulin. We talked about that. Uh, beers list. If you if if you're not, I'm not going to go I'd go over this too much in this lecture. But if you're not aware of the beers list, those are 48 medications and classes to avoid in patients over 65 years old. It's a study, um, but you, you don't need to review the whole study if you don't want. But uh, um, so, for example, Prozac. Be careful of Prozac. It's the it's the SSRI with the longest half life. So if you get a side effect, you're stuck with the half-life for quite a few hours or sometimes a few days. Non-steroidals, uh, we talked about that, GI bleeding, renal failure, uh, hypertension, heart failure. You're not supposed to, you got, well, it's not a 100% rule, but be very careful giving uh, a whole bunch of Motrin or Indesin to patients who have hypertension or heart failure. It can be, it can make it worse and it can cause lawsuits. Muscle relaxants. Uh, my take on that is nobody gets more than seven days of muscle relaxants ever. Uh, and I, I'm not going to debate with anybody on that, but uh, that's that's my practice. Um, it's Unless you walk in literally with torticollis, you don't get a muscle relaxant in my clinic. Um, the um, benzodiazepines, that goes without saying. Be careful with benzodiazepines. It causes falls in elderly people. Um, so simple strategies to avoid medication errors. So continuing, share information. Have a really, really, really good team where everybody communicates. You get people off in their own world not communicating or they don't like each other or whatever interpersonal funny things are going on. That leads to errors. So uh, figure out how to improve you know, communication, have a picnic, have a barbecue. Uh, I personally, with my new job uh, that, uh, that I just got, um, I, I'm the chief medical officer, um, I, and I'm not joking. I, my job is to bring donuts and coffee in the morning at, for our meetings, and uh, if I give a lecture in the afternoon, my job is to bring candy or snacks. And it's, just, it's a way to kind of just help people get, you know, um, have fun and, and improve communication and improve rapport with my staff. Um, avoid problematic abbreviations. Uh, we'll talk about that. That's one, the next slide, I think. Uh, similar drug names. That's really important. Isodo, Plendil, Celebrex, Cerebix, uh, Lamictal, Lamisil, Zyprexa, Zyrtec, Zantac. <laughs> they, they all sound a little similar, right? So you got to be very careful. Um, I didn't... Uh, actually, I'll make a comment on the second one there. Handwriting. Um, I will flat out admit that I have the worst handwriting of any doctor around. My first grade teacher looked at my handwriting when she was trying to teach me how to do the letters, and she goes, you're going to be a doctor someday. <laughs> um, but uh, be, if you can't read the handwriting, I, I will call specialists, cardiologists. Uh, I've done it before. And it, I guess it irritates them. I, I don't really care. I do it in a respectful manner, but I, if I can't read what they wrote, I'll call them on the phone and say, Doctor, I'm really sorry. I can't read your writing, your assessment, and your, and your diagnosis, and your recommendations to me. Can you please help me with that? <laughs> uh, it's, it's important uh, to do that because um, maybe he, he wrote something that you need to be doing that you're not doing because you can't read his writing. Uh, read verbal orders back. So <clears throat> um, the ner good nurses, uh, they, all hospitals, uh, nurses and hospitals are great at doing this now. So somebody, uh, you, uh, if you're a doctor on call and you say, hey, give this medication, ask the nurse to repeat it right back to you. Uh, that's a way of making sure it's correct. <clears throat> uh, electronic medical records. Um, I thought everybody had an electronic medical record until I took my last job in San Bernardino and they were using paper. It's the first time I've seen paper in 15 years. So some people still don't have electronic medical records. So, uh, But electronic medical records have safety uh, aspects to them that make that reduce medication errors. So that's good. Um, <clears throat> provide uh, an initial medication in-house uh, if you can. So uh, that's not always possible. Um, if you have the luxury of having a pharmacy or a pharmacist uh, and you write a medication, uh, you can do that. Uh, <clears throat> the people who are really good at this is Kaiser, right? Kaiser has, their, their, 
you're a doctor upstairs, you write a prescription, they walk downstairs to the Kaiser Pharmacy and they pick it up. They're not allowed to go to Walmart or something like that. They have to pick it up. But it's a way of reducing medication errors too, so that, that's kind of nice. Uh, labeling and storage. Uh, I'm not going to go over a whole lot of this. Uh, I, I'm the uh, immunization uh, uh, OIC for Debt J, and we, we, you know, we go over this a lot, and, uh, and we're lucky that we have the active duty guys during the week helping us with this. So, but this goes with medications and vaccines. So, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to review everything on that. Um, drug devices. Uh, do, be, um, don't use oral syringes for, uh, excuse me, IV syringes for oral medications. Um, there's, I, I think I might in the future put it. There's a case on uh, where. Uh, a doctor got sued because um, the um, uh, so the parent was using a, an IV syringe for oral medication, and I'll tell you what happened though. The the little plastic cap on the syringe came off, and the kid aspirated it. The child aspirated it, and it's a lawsuit. <laughs> the kid's probably fine, right? The the, the, the respiratory uh, the pulmonologist might have had to go down and pick it out or something, but. It's a lawsuit, um, so just don't do it. Um, patient education, oral and written. Hopefully your pharmacist does this, but as doctors we should do this. I'm not real good on educating patients if I know I have a good uh, pharmacist, but it's important to do anyway. Um, so error-prone abbreviations. This is the slide I was talking about. There's a whole bunch of more examples of this, but I'm going to put some basic ones here. Uh, unit, so don't write the letter U of, <laughs> it could be anything, right? Write the word, write the letters U-N-I-T, okay? It can be mistaken for zero, <clears throat> uh, number, <clears throat> number four or CC. Excuse me, I gotta take a drink, one second. Um, <clears throat> so I-U, <clears throat> don't write the word I-U. It might be U, it might be I-U, it might be I-V. If it's my handwriting, it looks like, it, you can't tell me if it's I-V or I-U. I can, but I'm the only person, so, you know, I'm, I'm a good example on that one. So write the word international unit. Don't write Q-D. <clears throat> it might be mistaken for Q-I-D. Uh, so write the word daily. Don't write Q-O-D. Um, <clears throat> it might be mistaken for Q-I-D or Q-D. Um, be careful. These last two are really important. Trailing zeros, right? 1.0 milligrams. The decimal point is missed. Okay, just instead of writing 1.0 milligrams, just write one milligram. Don't write a trailing zero because it, 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 the nurse might mistake it for 10 milligrams and uh, guess what? The doctor gets sued. Um, lacking lack of a leading zero. You need to put a leading zero. So don't write dot two for point two, write zero point two. These are just little things to improve uh, or reduce medication errors. So high alert medications, um, uh, yeah, I'm not going to read the whole slide, but you guys can look at this. Um, amiodarone, colchicine, heparin, uh, insulin, uh, lidocaine IV, magnesium sulfate, sulfate uh, injections. Um, I used to do a whole lot of uh, uh, labor and delivery, so we use magnesium all the time. Be careful, it, it, it's it's not 100% safe. Methotrexate uh, and nitroprusside, potassium injections and potassium IVs, uh, <clears throat> hypertonic saline is in there again, warfarin, uh, drug classes, <clears throat> and uh, so this goes back to what we were talking about. <clears throat> Antibiotics can lead to uh, allergies to the medications, auditory issues, uh, reduction uh, in effectiveness of oral contraceptives. That one is huge. <clears throat> I've seen lawsuits on that one. Uh, the uh, I do a little bit of work with the California Medical Board, not much, and uh, I've seen lawsuits on you give a medication, um, somebody gets pregnant, <laughs> and they sue you. It's a dumb lawsuit, but it's uh, it, it is what it is. Uh, you got to counsel people and. Uh, uh, you got you got a document in your chart. Hey, I asked them to use a second form of contraception or condoms or whatever. Um, so anticoagulants, bleeding, monitoring problems, dosing problems, uh, antineoplastic chemotherapeutic. Uh, so hematologists, oncologists, they they have a lot of issues sometimes. Glucocorticoids. I uh, this one I'll talk about because I I prescribe steroids. A lot of us do. Musculoskeletal problems, cutaneous problems, monitoring problems, inappropriate length of treatment, dosing problems. Long term it can lead to osteoporosis for example. Um, if I'm gonna, uh, my, for primary care, which is what I am, 
my recommendation is don't ever write long-term glucocorticoids. It, I, I'm not patients need that sometimes, but make your pulmonologist or your rheumatologist or somebody write the uh, recommendation and corroborate what you're doing. So uh, it's all you know. It's all about scope of practice and uh, doing things safely. Insulin uh, ordering problems, dosing problems, uh, interactions with other medications. IV calcium is kind of dangerous sometimes. And we're almost done. We're getting through here. Um, so other drug classes, uh, isotretinoin, uh, so ret retin-A, um, gastrointestinal problems, birth defects, monitoring problems, narcotics, that goes without saying, right? Addiction, uh, drug seeking, respiratory suppression, CNS and dosing problems, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, we talked about that with GI problems or bleeding, dilantin, uh, if you order dilantin, you have to get a phenytoin level, a dilantin level, right? You got to monitor and keep it and keep your drug in the correct dosing range. Potassium chloride, uh, dosing problems, administration problems. Theophylline, I like theophylline. I, I don't write for it very often. In fact, the only time I ever write for it is if I, if I have a severe as asthmatic who's failing everything, and usually I get a pulmonologist involved, but th there are side effects for theophylline. Respiratory, CNS, dosing and monitoring problems. Tranquilizers, uh, various kinds, addiction, drug seeking, dyskinesia. Um, I, and I will put, uh, I do hospice, uh, so if any of you write Haldol, uh, be careful of tardive dyskinesia. I haven't seen it in several years, but during my residency at UCSD, um, some guy was uh, running down the hallway waving an IV pole trying to hit the nurses, and we we got the police up there, and we, 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 we gave him a hefty dose of Haldol, and then he had tardive dyskinesia, which is the... Uh, uh, rigidity of that people get from uh, uh, overdosing Haldol sometimes. Um, high alert specialties. So I'll briefly talk about this uh, for the doctors here and, and nurses who practice in these areas. So family and general practice. Uh, so these are the reasons that these doctors get sued. This is my area. Diagnosis errors. No medical medical misadventure. Improper performance. Failure to supervise. Medication errors. If you're a doctor, be careful and supervise your PAs and nurse practitioners. If you're a doctor, make sure your organization has a peer review program that you review each other's charts occasionally, tiny percent, and make sure everybody's practicing quality medicine. Top five conditions associated with medication errors. Obesity, hypertension, back disorders, drug abuse, dependence, and asthma. So that's family practice. And uh, I won't go through every specialty, but there's uh, uh, OBGYN. Uh, so medical uh, top five conditions are headaches, viral warts, asthma, female infertility, pregnancy. Pediatrics, top five conditions are as, these are the result in medication errors is what I'm talking about. Asthma, routine well checks, bronchitis, epilepsy, convulsions. If you do pediatrics and you do well child checks, don't brush over some, uh, the whole thing. Do a good history and physical exam and if there's something that, that, that is important, identify the diagnosis and, uh, and you know, work it up. Uh, so specialties, percentage of claims by medical specialty, and we only got one more slide left, we're almost done. Uh, percentage of claims by medical specialty. <clears throat> internal uh, medicine is top of the list. 30.3% of claims are internal medicine. 29% of family practice. General surgery is down at 5%, uh, and then you can go down the list here. OBGYN, orthopedic surgery is 5%, pediatrics 4.3%, and the reason, I, I personally, I think the reason that internal medicine and family practice are way at the top of the list with 30% and 29% is we see the vast majority of patient visits. Um, I, I think it's that simple. Um, I, it's not that we're worse doctors or something like that. Um, so, um, so last slide, challenges and conclusions. Um, the way to improve this is to practice culture change. You have to look at your doctor office, your organization, your clinic, your hospital, and don't just work there. You have to look at it. Get on the P&T committee, pharmacy and therapeutics committee. Get on the quality committee. Even if you're not on the committee, uh, look at the processes in place and bring it up the chain in, in an appropriate, uh, respectful manner about things that might need to be improved. So the quality committee is important. Share information openly and honestly. Uh, make it very, this is for managers, but all, if you're a doctor or nurse, you, you, you're a leader. Uh, um, so make it very easy to learn from errors. So mention it, don't, uh, the, the one big thing on here is when you find these medication errors, uh, don't 
uh, don't punish people on the first time or uh, you know punishment or uh, is for repetitive uh, issues uh, so if you find a medication error go oops and then you you sit down in a peer review or a morbidity and mortality conference which is only credential providers administrators are not allowed to sit in it it's only credential providers and you all talk about how the error happened and you all educate people everybody on how to get uh, ideas on how to make it not happen it's not a punitive type of thing uh, and uh, look for system change that will help prevent future errors. So look at your clinicians and your office personnel, share past experiences, follow the literature on errors. I, that's, I get a kick out of that. I, 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 I watch how people get in trouble and I, and I learn from it and I try to educate other people. So that's all I have. Uh, I'm gonna turn off my Snagit and save my MP4 and then I'm gonna go back to the DCS and the conference call and I'm gonna answer any questions. So uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this off real quick.